for. So we make biodiesel that's made from any oil or fat and you convert it to a diesel, a different molecule that's used in a diesel engine. So we need oils and fats, which as you say, as farmers, we also can use waste oils and fats. So cooking oil from restaurants and things like that. So we, we have a, a wide pool of things, but they basically have to be lipids or oils and fats. So farmers really in the US don't grow anything for the oil or fat, canola being a bit of an exception, but soybean oil, for example, is the most common veg oil, oil in the US. Farmers grow soybeans for the protein, for the meal to feed to animals. So we're getting their byproduct. People grow pigs, chickens, and cows for the meat, not for the fat. So we're getting their byproduct, right? They use cooking oil coming from the restaurants. So we're always using the byproducts. So I think farmers appreciate the added value by creating this market for biodiesel and making biodiesel. Just to use another example, use 10 years ago or 15 years ago, use cooking oil. Restaurants had to pay someone to come pick it up because it, it was a waste. It had no value to them. It was, could, you couldn't put it down the drain. Um, and so they had to pay someone to come pick it up. Now, because of biodiesel, they have to lock it up because people will steal it from behind the restaurant. There are all sorts of stories of people driving up with a truck and, and pumping out someone's waste oil tank because it's now worth real money uh, because there's, we can make a product out of it. So that's an example to say where we have this value that we put into the economy that does make it back to the farmer, but I don't know that they see us as directly as they see uh, like corn prices, right? Because corn prices are their direct product. They see that um, we're sort of behind the scenes. So I, I say that as a long way of kind of leading up to the idea that I think farmers generally are very supportive of the biodiesel industry where I work, but but they don't quite tie it together. They're not as supportive of biodiesel as a product as uh, they it could be, um, because they use a lot of diesel, you know, in their in their farm equipment, for example. So, I've always thought that they're they're supportive, but they're not passionate advocates for our product, which is I think has to do with this remove these levels of distance, which kind of gets back to your point about what you know what's somebody's selfish interest. Well, if they can do something that'll add a dollar a bushel, they'll do that. If we're only adding that dollar a bushel through a very convoluted, convoluted economic system where it's a byproduct of a byproduct and it finally makes its way back to them. It's, we're not quite as visible, which is one reason I like to do a lot of, you know, speaking opportunities because people aren't really even aware that, that our product exists a lot of the time. Cause the other thing in the U S we don't drive diesel engines very often as passenger vehicles. I mean, there are lots of pickup trucks out there. Europe, 40 to 50% of the passenger vehicles are diesel in the U S it's a tiny single digit. Fraction. That's shocking to an American. And I think from my perspective, I always think, man, diesel's so dirty. Like when I was around farm trucks and all of that stuff, like it smells and it burns. Why is Europe so heavily leaning towards diesel? So they have been all along and for years. I mean, since World War II, it, diesel engines are more efficient than uh, gasoline engines. And that's just kind of one of these thermodynamic fundamental facts about the way the engines work. <clears throat> the most efficient engine you could make on a combustion side would be a what's called a compression ignition engine. And that's what diesel engines are. There's no spark plug. Uh, it compresses the fuel until it ignites. So thermodynamically, that's the most efficient way to do it. And not just thermodynamically, it has to do with how the flame, flame propagates through the cylinder as it burns. Um, so just know that. And therefore, because just like European passenger vehicles are typically a lot smaller than those in the US because fuel economy. So for fuel economy reasons, uh, they have been using diesels as passenger vehicles for decades. A diesel engine you know, can get 50 miles per gallon, whereas a, a spark ignition is lucky to get 35 miles per gallon, so or 40 maybe now. So that's why they use them in Europe. The US has always had relatively cheap fuel prices, um, other than a few spikes here and there. So the fuel economy push hasn't been nearly as prominent, and so therefore we used gasoline because of that perception it's cleaner it burns cleaner it's easier to use you know wintertime issues where diesel fuel can gel up whereas gasoline flows year-round so for a variety of reasons uh, the u.s dominantly gasoline europe about 50 50 and uh because of that most people like you or me before i worked in this industry i i didn't know anything about diesel fuel all i knew was like you saw the black soot coming out of the buses as i was riding my bike behind them when i was going up to my my office and when I was in graduate school. So back to your point then, I guess, diesel definitely has a reputation of being dirty, 
and historically there was a lot of visible soot, you know, visible pollution coming out of diesel engines. The EPA created rules for diesel engines that started 15 years ago and have been ramping up where diesel engines now, the we call them tier four or new technology diesel engines, are have so many emissions controls on them that the exhaust coming out of them is cleaner in many cases than the air coming in the front. <laughs> so the air that goes in to burn often has more stuff in it than what's coming out the tailpipe. So new diesel engines are actually extremely clean. They're, they're as clean as gasoline engines, if not cleaner in some ways, because they have more stuff cleaning up the exhaust. Um, but I ride around with people workmen all the time that yeah. hate the, the, the cattle, like the, the, is it a catalytic conversion? Is that what it is? Is that there's right. Yeah. So catalytic, there's what we think of as a catalytic converter in a gas car is basically just burning up the excess hydrocarbons. So you don't smell, you know, the gasoline smell and that doesn't get emitted in the atmosphere. There are a couple, there are two, if not three different catalytic converters on a diesel engine. Um, one that reduces NOx, nitrogen oxides, one that reduces the hydrocarbons, and then one that does kind of a cleanup of the stuff that comes out of the NOx <laughs> conversion. So, and then they have a what's called a diesel particulate filter, which is a big monolithic honeycomb thing that all the f exhaust has to flow through and all the particles get trapped in the d diesel particulate filter. So, so those newer in if you are still sm smelling or seeing anything coming out of an exhaust of a diesel it's probably an older technology <laughs> diesel engine so so uh when your company produces a biodiesel then who do they sell it to can some can anybody just pull up and start putting that in well, their tank well that would be nice because i have a diesel uh jetta that i bought when i first started working here that i i don't have a good place to fill it up it depends on the state you're in but for the most part we are we would be considered a big company in the biodiesel space. You know, so Renewable Energy Group is, is the big one in the U.S. We historically sold it to oil com petroleum companies who had, a, had an obligation to acquire a certain amount of renewable energy credits or re called RINs, renewable identification numbers, which they can get from ethanol, they can get from biodiesel, they can get from other renewable fuels. So it sold a lot to them. We would sell to truck stops the big major truck stop companies that you see along the highway, um, they would blend it and they would get those credits and they could sell those credits. Then um, we, wait, we have, who are they selling the credits to? Is this, a, uh, is this, yeah, yep. let's talk about this. Right. So this is a federal program. Once again, it was started by George W. Bush. It's a, so it actually came out of a Republican administration. It's the renewable fuel standard, the EPA's renewable fuel standard program. And they created requirements for refiners and importers of petroleum. So if you either refine the petroleum in the U.S. or you import petroleum into the U.S., you get an obligation that you have to meet a certain, it's called your renewable volume obligation. You have to acquire so many of these credits, these RINs, to satisfy that based on the size of your production or your importing. Um, so basically proportional to how much petroleum you're bringing into the marketplace. And these volume obligations have ramped up fairly slowly, but they've ramped up over time. Um, and that's the renewable fuel standard, RFS. So RENs are these credits that get attached to the renewable fuel, whether it's ethanol or biodiesel or something called renewable diesel, which we also make now. But those credits have to end up in the hands or the pockets of the petroleum companies. So they can either buy the fuel from us directly and get the credit with the fuel, or if we sell it to someone else, who blends the fuel with petroleum to, to go out into the world like a truck stop, they then have those credits which they can sell back to the petroleum companies. And so there's a trading market for these RINs, for these credits. What is the power differential between a um, like a gallon of, of diesel and a gallon of your biodiesel? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So the absolute, if you just took a gallon of each and burned them, right, you would get about 6% less energy out of the biodiesel roughly. So when you blend, most biodiesel is used at blends of B20, so 20% or less. So at B20 or less, it's it's about 1% less, which is probably gonna be tough to detect. Although biodiesel does have two mitigating factors. One is that it, it actually burns much more cleanly. So if you had an, those old engines we were talking about that put the black smoke out still, if those engines would use bio, straight biodiesel, the black smoke goes away. So that's it, a lot less particulate matter, a lot less hydrocarbon um, smell. So, so you get more efficient combustion because biodiesel has oxygen in the molecule. It's an oxygenated fuel, so it burns better. 
And the other one is biodiesel is very lubricating. And it, I didn't know this till I worked in the industry, but diesel engines, the cylinders are partly lubricated by the fuel. So the fuel itself has to be lubricating and, and petroleum diesel has a lubricity additive added to it so that the, you don't get more friction in the cylinder cause, cause energy loss, right? To generate heat. So the combination being more lubricating and better burning in, in practice, many studies have shown that at that 20% level, there's no detectable uh, fuel economy difference. And sometimes biodiesel blends even do better Depends on the drive cycle, you know, how you're driving start stop, for example, does better with biodiesel and petroleum diesel, long haul, long haul trucking or railroads kind of burn at a real steady rate. So you start to approach that theoretical number better. But so the short answer is a little less per gallon. The long answer is when blended and in practice, it comes out to no detectable difference. And most people use 20% or less biodiesel. <laughs> Thanks for checking out this podcast short. If you like this interview, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button and hit that bell so you always get notified about this podcast. And if you're really interested in conversations like this, you may want to consider joining the Articulate Ventures Network. To find out more, go to network.articulate.ventures.